here's a kid, 28, 29, 30, 33 year old kid, saying, Oh, my life's a mess. Everything's falling apart. I don't know what God's doing. Well, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why do you bring God into this for? Well, what do you mean? Well, what's going on with you? Oh, I got a ticket. <laughs> for what? Well, just speed, speeding it. What else has happened? Well, I actually got arrested. And why'd you get arrested? Well, because, I mean, it wasn't my stuff, man. It was, it was somebody in the back seat with possession. Uh-huh, and, and you don't know why God's doing this stuff. See, God gets the rap all the time. <laughs> and the story begins. I've heard it a thousand times. Man, this is my friends, it was just one of my, my friends. What? My friends had this stuff. I got arrested. Why, listen, why was he your friend? And by, and by this time now, it's like, they're getting a little frustrated. Dude, man, I came for some comfort. No, you're not going to get any comfort. Because you know what? Listen, the Bible is good for many things, but one of them is, the Bible is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And dude, you're a little bit too comfortable in blaming other people and realizing that whatever kind of life you live, whatever seeds you throw out into the ground, they're going to sprout and grow, and you are now reaping what you're sowing. So here's the deal. What you want to do is start making the right decisions beginning now. And a lot of people today don't want to hear that. But that's the only answer. Make the right decisions. God's got the answer. He wants to give you the answer. Expect the answer. God is good. And he says, walk in the right path. When you know that this is the wrong temptation coming your way, God says, run from it. Get away from it. Listen, if you're at the drinking fountain and Bubbles is batting her eyes at you, run. <laughs> if some guy comes down the street and you have a drinking problem and he's got Jim Beam written across his chest, run. Are you with me? You understand that? Oh, man, I don't know what happened. Yes, you do. You know exactly how this happened. You didn't run. And God simply says, like a wonderful parent, don't do that, which leads us to argument number two. This is God's will for you this year, is that you do the right thing. Us as a church, we're to do the right thing. You as a family, you as a husband, you as a wife, you as a single person, you're to do the right thing. You're to make the right decisions. And making the right decisions, this is what's cool. Now look, this is going to raise some eyebrows. I understand that. You and I do not, now that we're Christians, we do not have to make mistakes. If we just wait and follow his word. That's a big statement, I know. But it just goes to show you, rather than putting God on the spot, it puts us on the spot. Because have we not all made mistakes? Yes, why did we make them? Because we didn't wait on the Lord. We didn't wait for him to answer. I felt like it was the thing to do. And do you still feel that way now? No. <laughs> then God wasn't in it. I've had people tell me, God told me to move. Listen, in the foyer, people will come. God told, hey, pastor, God, God told me to move. Goodbye. <laughs> it was nice having you here. Make sure wherever you go, you go to a good Bible teaching church. That's my pat response. And then, how do you explain this? God told them to go. Then they couldn't get a job. They couldn't find a church. And they wind up coming back and moving in with family and being a burden to their entire family. And then the question is said, I don't know why God's doing this. My dear friend, God was not in it at all. Well, you didn't say anything to me. I will never say anything to you when you tell me God told you to move. You think I'm going to contradict what you think you're hearing from God? Don't do a thing without chapter and verse. If you don't, you're going to make a decision based upon your emotions and your feelings. And when that happens, you will turn and you will say this new year when things flop, I don't know why God's doing this. He's not confused. God knows exactly what he's doing. You and I will make mistakes when we're not listening and we're not obeying him. So that second argument is to do the right thing. He says there in verse 8, to love mercy. To love mercy. The word mercy, merciful, both in Greek and Hebrew, is the word to act compassionately toward 
others. Boy, that's a big open-ended definition. Is it not to act compassionately towards others, to be toward others tenderly, softly, caring toward others, to feel for them as if you were them? Listen, if you attend this church, we are under orders by God Almighty to go into this new year being merciful to those that are in need. Jesus said in Luke 6, 36, Therefore be merciful just as your Father also is merciful. Is God not merciful to us? Oh yeah. Then we are to be merciful towards others. This means that you and I extend that to them. Now you might say, and I understand this feeling. Somebody says to you, please forgive me. I understand that. Watch. If somebody says, please forgive me, you don't know if they're telling you the truth or not, right? And listen, just because you extend forgiveness or mercy towards them doesn't mean you take them home with you. You can forgive them. You can say, listen, I forgive you. A lot of, a lot of listen, there's a lot of broken marriages that need to hear this, for example. I can't stand my ex. Well, that's a sin. You don't know what she or what he, I don't need to know, I don't want to know. But you can't live like that. God says to the Christian, extend mercy to him and mercy to her. What does that mean? That means as much as it is possible, you live in, in your understanding with them. You treat them kindly. And even if kindly simply means, if I see you, I will wave to you. That's as far as we can take it. I'm not ready for anything else. Then that's fine. Are you with me? But if you see them, you don't start to load your double barrel shotgun up. That's not mercy. You understand that? But there's a mercy to be extended by the Christian. And when you see somebody in need, you're to help them. The Bible tells us for this year to come, listen to this, 1 John 3, 17 and James 2. 1 John 3, 17 says, But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, imagine, 1 John's written to the Christians. So he says, If a Christian has worldly goods which we all do, and he sees another Christian in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. In other words, don't talk about it. Do it. You see, do it. Do the right thing. See, see somebody in need. Don't talk about it. It gets stronger. James chapter 2. Are we all okay right now? James 2.14. James James, James is a spiritual stud, by the way. You know, in church history, when James died, in church history, it's not in the Bible, in church history, James was known to pray so much that what was noted about James' physical body when they wrapped his body for burial is James's knees were completely callous. They said he had knees like a camel because he spent so much time in prayer. Wow. James 2.14 says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Technically, can faith alone save him? You see, faith and works. Faith is what bears out works, true faith. If you say you believe in God and there's no works in your life, then you don't have real faith. Faith or works among you and I qualifies among you and I your real faith. Works confirms our faith. You're not saved by your works. That's impossible. You're saved by faith. But if you have true faith, true faith will produce good deeds. Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked, can you imagine? Oh, hey, dude, what? Oh, you're a Christian? Oh, we go to the same church and you're naked? And destitute of food? You're hungry? Wow, bummer. Dude, you're naked and you're hungry and we go to the same church. Wow. And one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and be filled. But you do not give them the things which are needed for their body. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Can you imagine? Hey, man, you're, you look hungry. I'm starving. And you're kind of naked. Yeah, I don't have any clothes. I got robbed. Dude. And I think I saw you at church. Yeah, I go to second service. Wow. I tell you what, I'll pray for you. Dude, <laughs> Lord, bless this guy and help him with his hunger and help him find some clothes. In Jesus' name. 
Hey, maybe I'll see you at church sometime. See you later. Be warm. Be warm, brother. Be filled. See ya. <laughs> Could you imagine? The Bible says that, that, guy, that guy, that guy's not a real believer that walks away from that need. So we go into the new year ready and armed to do mercy. God wants us to do mercy. This way, jot it down if you would. Doing the right thing means that we're going to honor God in doing the right thing. So how do you know I'm doing the right thing? I can guarantee you this. If it honors God, it's the right thing. You'll sense, listen, I'm speaking to the Christian this morning. You will know if what you're about to do is God honoring because God will give you the bold liberty and freedom to do it. You won't have a check in your heart. You won't have a, hmm, I hope nobody sees this. <laughs> That's the Holy Spirit telling you this will not honor God. The Bible says again in 1 John 5, 3, for this is the will or this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. I want you to think about this for a moment. Look on the screen or look on your Bible. For this new year to come, keep this in mind. In light of Micah 6, 8, this is the answer in 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love or the will of God, some of your Bibles have it, that we keep his commandments. The moment you hear that, you go, ah! wait, and his commandments are not burdensome. Whew. What does this mean? That means it is God in you that spawns, produces, stimulates your heart, your walk, your Christianity to do the good thing, to love mercy, uh, to walk humbly with God. It's your heart that says, listen, the redeemed soul says, God's ways are perfect. I'm imperfect. Watch. Self-examination, I see my failures. Oh God, make me stronger. By the power of your spirit, fix these things in my life. Let's get up and go. I trust you. That's God's grace. Introspect, oh, I, he has commandments. I can't meet one of them. Oh, I'm just going to shrivel up and die. Why? Because you're bound in legalism. Performance, self-performance. Breeds spiritual depression. God says, no, not for this new year. I know your weaknesses. I know your frailties. But what is your heart speaking? I've put a new heart in the believer. And the heart of the new believer says, I want to walk with God. His commandments are awesome. I just often fail at performing them. But that's where your grace comes in, almighty God. And so, Lord, when I fall down, if I fall down a thousand times, pick me up. I want to walk with you. And happy is the man who understands what I'm talking about today. Because God is at work in your life. Next, the right thing will always benefit others. How do you know if you're going to be doing the right thing? Listen, it's going to benefit others. Are you a Christian? Yes. And where are you a Christian? I'm a Christian at Boeing. Or I'm a Christian at the cement factory. Or I'm a Christian in my neighborhood. Wherever you're at, your faith, if it's being in this next year, properly executed, will benefit other people. Did you know that? And where does it begin? Well, the Bible says here in Deuteronomy 10... Verse 12, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Doesn't that sound like Micah? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Isn't that great? God tells us to do the right thing and the best thing. Now, so listen, I wrote this down. Husbands and fathers, if husbands and fathers today, at the end of this year, and before you and I get back together next Sunday, it'll be a whole brand new year. If, if husbands and fathers, raise your hand. If you're a husband or a father, raise your hand. Wow. Put your hands down. If today you decide, if you make this decision, because it will honor God, it will benefit others, 
that from this moment on, you are going to live, breathe, work, and serve your wife and your kids. That's, that's your, oh, I want to I wanna, uh, get my master's in theology. Why don't you just stay home? Seriously, stay home and make sure your wife and your kids are going to heaven. Amen. Well, you don't know, realize how close I am to getting my doctorate in uh, theology. Forget it. Put it on pause. Husbands, fathers, make sure your wife and your kids are blessed and seeing Christianity in your life. Amen. So what? Well, well, that's a better response than first service. I think some people left at first service, so <laughs> this is encouraging. Wives and moms, or maybe this is where they left. <laughs> wives and moms, wives and moms. If you decided today, at the end of this year and at the brink of a new year, to live and breathe and to work and to serve the Lord, your husband, your, ch your children, imagine. Because are you a wife in here? Raise your hands. Are you a wife? Are you moms? Any moms in here? Moms? Yeah? You know what? You know what God's will is for your life this year? To live, breathe, move. Uh, blessing your husband, blessing your kids. Husbands, fathers, bless your wife, bless your kids. Well, I'm single. You, I can feel the single people go. Phew. <laughs> Look, I love you, but you're in the worst. You're in a big heap of trouble if you're single. Because let's, Paul, the apostle, said it perfectly. He said, Guy, "Men who are married, they have to they have to spend some time pleasing their wives and taking care of them." That's this the way it is. Paul says you got to do it. Do it. Uh, and vice versa for the wife to the husband. Uh, the single person. Yeah, man, dude, I'm single. I ain't got, I don't have all the grief you guys have. Uh, okay. And you get to keep your money, too, if you're single. Right? So you think. If you're single, there's a greater responsibility placed upon you. If you're single, listen, technically, single people should be running the ministries of this church because most of them have the money and most of them have time. Think about this for a moment. Where, where does most ministry uh, happen or how does it happen? Most, minis, most, most of the ministry activity happens at the hands of people who have no time. It's usually moms and dads with kids and stuff. I'm not saying young people, single people don't serve, but they could a lot much more, a lot much more with, this, with this challenge for the new year because they're freed up from a lot of commitments that married people don't have to invest in. So as we go into this new year, none of us as believers are off the hook. We're all called to do the right thing to benefit others. And then also this, you guys, the right thing will always be the right thing. <laughs> Say, well, that was the right thing in 1925, but I don't think it is today. Well, that's because we're so perverse. That's because we're so far from what's right. The right thing is the thing, remember, that honors God and blesses others. That never changes. The right thing is always the right thing. The culture, remember, we live in a time that says good is evil, evil is good. No, the right thing is always the right thing. And we need to keep that in mind that... With our bodies, with our minds, with our mouths, our hands, our feet, our eyes, consider us, ourselves, as tools being put into the hands of God to be doing the right thing. Just do the right thing. We're watching some of our Marines and some of our army head off to war in the Middle East. Can you imagine, listen, when God says, as their commanders will say, do this. this look, I don't know how it works, but they don't, they don't get up in front of all the guys and say, hey, I was thinking. <laughs> the, the, sergeant is, the sergeant's not going to come up and say, hey, guys, hey, uh, locked and loaded, right? Ready to go? I was thinking. You know what? Those guys will turn around and leave him that fast. no. He barks out the commands. And God says to us, this new year, do this. Remember, he's saying this to us so strongly and so directly for our own good. 
He wants this to end well because he already knows the answer. So do this. God is saying to us, do the right thing. Not based on feeling, not based on emotions, not based on consensus, not based on the polls. God says do this. And then finally we end with this. This is God's will for you and I this year that you and I think the right way. We think the right way. He says to walk humbly with your God. This is fun. These are very colorful words. Uh, Circle the word walk and the word humble. Two different words that sound very similar when you look at the definition. Number one, the word walk here in Hebrew means watch. It means, you have to watch me. Look, look, look up here. It means to walk like this. It means to walk bowed down. So how do you walk bowed down like that? He's talking about an attitude of your heart, of your person. To walk bowed down. The word walk is to walk bowed down. Okay? And the word implies to carry a load of a, of a thing or of a person. So you all know this. You ever picked up something that was super heavy? What do you do? Well, you, it puts you under pressure. It puts you under tension. And so you're walking like this. <laughs> so God says, this is how I want you to walk. Okay? The next word, to walk humbly. What does that word mean? The word humbly means, hear me out, the word means to walk this way, humbly, with a self-imposed humiliation. Isn't that an interesting word? A self-imposed humiliation, meaning this, that you recognize your position before your creator. I'm the created, he's the creator. It ultimately means this, because the word usage for the messianic words of the Messiah, remember Zechariah tells us that the Messiah would come to us lowly, humble, riding on the back of a little donkey? Micah, the prophet, is announcing to all believers, if you want to walk with God, you have to walk like God. How does God walk? Look, look. Have you noticed how people walk who think they're God? (laughs) Have you seen them walk and have you seen them talk to people? I'm not kidding. Look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention something, and it's gonna, you're going to immediately... I, I, I want you to exercise self-control. I didn't show any... There's not going to be any pictures on the wall or on the screens. But For example, do you remember guys like um, Mussolini? You ever see him? Uh, he looked like he's about three feet tall to me in all the documentaries. That doesn't matter. He would walk up to the podium or to the microphone or before the masses in Italy. He would walk up, and he would go like this. Okay? Uh, Now, next one. Adolf Hitler. I don't know what's with this one hand bit, but... (laughs) Notice the... Uh, next, Saddam Hussein. You notice this? Mao Zedong. Never, never stops. People with their head cocked back, looking down at you. I don't know if they're saying, is there anything in the back cave? Anything? <laughs> Any bugs up there? Help me out here, will you? <laughs> they are so sick. In their minds, they've, they are, they are, they've, they're megalomaniacs. They're little gods. The world was created for them to be served by it. And then comes Jesus. The very word usage that we're supposed to walk this new year is how Jesus always walked. In his demeanor, and imagine the vibe that Jesus sent out wherever he came He was always bearing the load and burdens of others. That's what Isaiah said. And he says, God says, walk with me. 
this year ahead, we're to walk with him as a church bearing the loads and cares of others. We look inside only long enough to determine if we're on target. And then we quickly look back to the cross. We don't look inside and keep looking inside. Then we get swallowed up with spiritual depression and decay. And we begin to wax away in the corner in total defeat. No, we keep our eyes on the cross. And all along the way, we are bearing the burdens of others. This is how our God taught us to walk. And that's how we will decide to walk. Let's stand if we would and let's make, a, let's make a vow to the Lord today. I know this is the great moment of temptation to get your car out of the parking lot first, but we've punctured all the tires. This is a serious, precious, joyful, ominous, ominous moment, if you would. I'm not... I'm not asking you to do this. You'd have to do it of your own volition, of your own will, of your own choosing. But this is the end of this year. It's, listen, in a few days this year, we'll go down in the annals of history. There's no taking it back, ladies and gentlemen. What we have done for Jesus, those opportunities now are in the archives of God. The awesome thing is, in his mercy, there's a new year ahead of us. And we can be reckless for God this year. And that's going to be awesome. But let's close our eyes, if, if you would. And lift, lift our hands, if you would, if you're willing. And Father, we come before you today as a church family. And we're asking you, Lord, to take notice of this. As we must look like little mice, speaking to you right now, I would think. Almost like the sound of a bird chirping. <laughs> But to us, this is serious, Jesus, as serious as we possibly can make it. We're asking you to so fill us with your Holy Spirit and with your word that we would enter this new year galvanized, that we would be lights in shining armor to this world around us, to our families, that we who truly know you would be agents of healing, of restoration, that we would extend forgiveness, mercy, that we would do the right thing. God cause us to make the right decisions, to see to it that your life, your word, your name is honored, and that others are blessed by us knowing you. And Lord, that we go into this new year thinking Bible, speaking Bible, thinking the right way. And so we commit ourselves to you as you witness this. In mercy, O Lord, keep us on the straight and narrow. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen.